Well, folks, uh, he is a statistician, news reporter for sports, an author of 75, the best NBA players and teams rated by a statistician who has seen games since 1947. He lists the 75 best players. This is his book. Now, whether you're into sports or basketball or not, I think we'll enjoy chatting with Dave. He's very interesting and uh, a pioneer in the statistics field. And uh, Dave, I appreciate your time uh, chatting with us. Well, it's good to be on with you, Brandon. Uh, Dave, before we get too much into um, the book and some of that, talk a little bit about yourself, where you grew up and, you know, did you play sports when you were a kid and your affinity to kind of go down that uh, arena of being a statistician? Well, I was hooked on sports when I was, I think, in kindergarten. Hmm. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I got to go to some of the games early. My dad worked for the New York Times Sports Department. He was one of the editors. And uh, he used to get tickets. He got tickets to Madison Square Garden. He got tickets to see the Yankee Stadium. So by the time I was nine or 10 years old, I was going to games. And even when I was not at the games, I was listening secretively on my radio. I didn't think my parents knew, but I'm sure they did. Um, because I just, I was just such a, a huge fan of all the New York teams, the Knicks, the, the Rangers, the Yankees. Well, I had to pick out one baseball team and it was the Yankees. I love Mickey Mantle. Uh, and in football, um, <coughs> not so much at that time. Later on, uh, I did work f for the Miami Dolphins or, or, or for a newspaper covering the Miami Dolphins when they won their two Super Bowls. So I was in the right place at the right time quite a bit. And I had a lot of opportunities to not only meet uh, great athletes, but, but other personalities in sports. It was it was an amazing career, really. A lot of fun. And in your book, you kind of talk about, you know, your uh, time at, at, at Delaware, uh, going to college and kind of trying to find your path a little bit. Uh, speak to that a little bit about uh, kind of like finding your way, so to speak. Well, as far as statistics were concerned, uh, it did come about at the university. My dad and mom did not want me to be a journalist, or at least my dad didn't. So I, and they, and they had, I had an aptitude for mathematics and the sciences. So I entered Delaware as a, a chemical engineer major. And of course, DuPont has is, is a big connection with the uh, University of Delaware. But by the time I got through my freshman, first term as a freshman, uh, I was ready to quit. I could not stand the lab, in inhaling these poisonous fumes all the time. And there were a lot of graduate students who were 25 and they looked 45 because they were ing ingesting this poison. So I said, I'm not, I'm not gonna be a chemical engineer. I'm not gonna be a chemist. And it was around that time that one of the guys in, in the dormitory where I was staying, uh, he was the sports editor of the student newspaper. We got to talking about a lot, a lot of sports. And he said, well, why don't you come and, and write some sports for me? And I, I kind of hesitated because I knew my dad didn't want me to do it, but it seemed like that was the way I was going. I mean, <laughs> I loved sports. So I did. And at a basketball game, it, it, it just occurred to me while I was watching it and covering it, that the guy who was supposedly the Delaware star, averaged 18 points a game, really wasn't very good. Um, he was a very selfish guy. Um, there have been a couple like that in, in the NBA that got away with it. Um, he scored a lot, mainly because he took so many shots, a lot of them very bad shots. But I started doing this little stat thing. Um, and I, I added points plus rebounds plus assists, and I subtracted missed shots. At that time, there weren't any stats kept for steals, blocks, turnovers, and minutes played, we didn't have those, you know, not at the college level anyway. Uh, actually, at that time, they had just started doing the minutes played in the NBA, and they'd had it for a few years. But minutes played was even a new, a new stat. But when I added and subtracted, the, the guy who was supposed to be the star came up with a lower positive rating than this other guy who didn't score much, but he didn't take bad shots. He rebounded, he played defense, he played. He was a good, pretty, pretty good player. Much better than the guy who was averaging 18 points. And it really went from there uh, because little by little, I was able to um, get to the intangibles uh, 
divided like by minutes played when it was when it was started, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, divided by game pace, which is the number of ball possessions, which is the number of opportunities to do things. Mm -hmm. And it, it wound up with not, not just 10, but 15 different elements in, in the 10 dex value rating, which was the best one. I stopped at 10 when I named it. And that was in the mid eighties when I, for the first time started to rate the college players. To do that, had to enter a a rating for strength of schedule and also in rate of improvement. Michael Jordan was off the chart in rate of improvement. He was not that great a college player. He was good, not great. I think he won one title with a great shot, but college, he wasn't great, but he was going like this mm -hmm. and he kept going like that. John Stockton was the same way. Uh, both of them were un grievously underrated in the in 1984 draft. Jordan was number three when he should have been number one. Ten Ducks had him number one. Stockton was number 16, and Ten Ducks had him tied for third with Barkley, but really better because he, his, his rate of improvement was better than Barkley's. Ten Ducks had him right. And from that time forward, Ten Ducks actually had a better record in rating players. Uh, where there was enough stats to, to rate them uh, than did the scouts. And that was especially true in the drafts. Uh, the, the drafts were lopsided in favor of Tendex um, because of the sophisticated elements like the uh, rate of improvement and uh, strength of schedule, things like that that were important, but not nobody else did had those things and you had, had, had to do a lot of arithmetic to do those. <laughs> and most guys just wanted to add and subtract and didn't even want to divide. Uh, even some of the, some of the NBA coaches that uh, contacted me, they, they really just wanted to strip it down to this uh, to subtraction and, and addition and no division. And there really were five divisors by the time 10 decks became 15 decks. <laughs> uh, which, which was at its best. Uh, but most people didn't want to do division, especially if it involved something that you had to compete, compute yourself, like strength of schedule ratings. Mm -hmm. how, how do you do that? You, know, you right. had to go team by team and, you know, these were not easy things to do. And also there was a positional rating. You cannot compare centers with shooting guards because centers have big advantage. They're close to the basket, easy shots, easy rebounds. Shooting guards are on the perimeter, unless you had a guy like Jordan who could go inside, you know, but most shooting guards stay on the perimeter. And for that reason, the NBA encyclopedia that came out uh, 2003 did not have Michael Jordan as the NBA's MVP a single time because they were using an antiquated version of Tendex that did not have positional standard. Uh, Bob Alotti had said, had asked me for it, and said, yeah, you can do it. I don't like it, it's no good, it doesn't work. And so he took it and it wound up in this encyclopedia. And I, I know it got a lot of, ten, of Jordan fans angry because uh, Tendex value rating had him MVP eight times. The encyclopedia had it zero. Right. Uh, and you know how the fans were with Jordan. Yeah, he sounds good to me. My, the myself, yeah. Had him five times, so Tendex actually had him three more than the league did. Hmm. It really is fascinating. It's kind of a statistical nerd myself. It was uh, a really cool thing that I wanted to spend some time on in uh, in the book. And if, if folks, if you have somebody who's a sports fan, NBA basketball fan, seventy five, we'll have links uh, for you to get a copy. Um, you know, Dave, you. You've been doing this for so you talk about 75 years, but you've been doing this like, you know, I love your story about Wilt Chamberlain, you know, coming sure. over your shoulder, basically, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, being kind of rooted in New York, were you there for the 100 point game? No, but I, I, I know what the circumstances were. Um, the next, in fact, Cleveland Buckner, who was kind of a friend of mine, we used to shoot around. And I actually beat him one time, shoot, shoot, shoot out, and he could shoot. But he was a kind of skinny like me, but about six, seven. It would be like me playing against Jordan, you know, um, tiny, you know, 
Cleveland Buckner wound up playing in that game against Will because, and I can't remember, was it Daryl Limhoff? It was the, the Knicks' regular center, who at least was big, even if he, you know, couldn't, he couldn't compete with Will, but he, he wouldn't have given up 100 points to him. Uh, but Imhoff had an injury or something and didn't, couldn't play. So Cleveland Buckner, uh, my buddy, just got Will just slaughtered him. And that was one of the few times in Will's career that he actually shot well from the free throw line. Mm, he made okay. something like 28 out of 32 or something like that. Um, it, it, just, <laughs> it was just one of those incredible games. People got really excited. I think, I think it was uh, um, Kobe Bryant got 75 or 80 some one time. Well, that's still 20 plus short of Will. I mean, you know, 100 points in a game. And that was unbelievable. Even, even, against, even against Cleveland Buckner, that was unbelievable. <laughs> And that, you basically answered kind of like my sister question of that was like, you know, because Wilt has so many games in the 60s, it was kind of commonplace. But to, you know, what what happened that goes from, you know, 60 to 100 is just shocking. And you pointed out, you know, Kobe's 81 point game. But uh, yeah, free throw point. I, I didn't know that part of the story. I'm glad you shared that with me. I've seen some clips and things. Um, obviously, I wouldn't have seen the game or anything like that. But I've loved going back and trying to garner a better appreciation for uh, the players from those eras that were, you know, before me. Um, Oscar Robinson is one who's, you know, we'll talk about several times, I'm sure, because he, you know, I, I recently mentioned your book. I was talking to somebody, that I, I had it on my desk and someone asked me about it. I said, you know, the thing you don't probably know anything about Oscar Robinson, you know, he had triple doubles like regularly. This was not like, uh, you know, Russell uh, Westbrook, who's doing it on purpose and other players who, you know, do it intermittently. This was, this was Oscar. That was just, that was the game. And that was part uh, of his game. Yeah. That was just the game of him. And it's, it's, it's just, it's really incredible. Um, when you, when you look back, cause there's, um, I, I've heard you speak, uh, a couple interviews about like the different eras of the game, you know, the, you know, the 50s, 60s, the seventies, the eighties, 90s, whatever, uh, talk about, I know you've said this before in other interviews, but how do you repeat it? Um, like what changes in the game to kind of call cause the sort of peaks and valleys in the quality of the game for say like these 10 to 15 year eras? Well, starting at the beginning, and I do remember seeing games, you know, before 1950, um, it, the league was not viable. The players were not getting in any money. Uh, Kiki Vandeweghe, who was one of the next best players, had to quit midseason to go back to his uh, physician practice in order to make ends meet. That's still crazy uh, to me, by the way, because he was so, a really great player. <laughs> he was a good player. Yeah. Uh, um, <coughs> but the thing, the thing about it was these guys really couldn't, afford, first of all, they couldn't afford to keep themselves in the rock solid shape because most of them were in different kind of fields. When you're an athlete, you know, you spend a lot of time, automatically you go to the weight room, even, even, even back in the, in the mid fifties, maybe not in the forties, but by the mid fifties, uh, after, the, after the advent of the 24 second clock, the league grew up. By that time, guys were going to the weight room, you know, even in high school, college. Um, and that made a big difference. Guys were swimming, they were running, they were, they were doing things that made them in better physical condition than the guys who came into the league 46, 47, up until about 1954. And it, I don't think it was coincidental either because that was actually when the first superstars come in, came into the league in the mid fifties, Pettit, Russell, Robertson was ready but unfortunately, he was not. They weren't going to let him. He, he was just dominant in, in college ball. Mm -hmm. But they weren't going to let him play until his senior senior year had come about. That was his role in those days, and really, that's that's not constitutional because they're depriving this guy who is an adult the opportunity to earn a living wage. By the time we get to the '60s, when Robertson is in the league and Chamberlain. Um, and by the way, that was the year, 60, I think it was 61, 62, the great year for both of them. Mm -hmm. um, and just phenomenal ratings off the chart. Um, and, and actually, Robertson was slightly higher. And this was when they weren't even counting all the assists because they, they, that came about later. You know that story about how mm -hmm. 
the, the way of, of uh, rating assists changed when the league decided finally to count as an assist a pass to a back to the back back to the basket player. And by the time Robertson was with Abdul Jabbar, they were doing that six, seven times a game, and he wasn't getting credit for any of them except against the Lakers in, in LA because the Lakers were doing that. They were counting back to the basket uh, passes for assists. So Robertson could have, he could have averaged you know 30, 15, and 15 in, wow. in his in, in his best season because he could have easily gotten 15 assists if he was getting credit for the ones that he got. Then, if, then as you add on to it, well, you're going to try for more, you know, 17 or 18. Uh, the guy was a phenomenal player. Um, my first job was as uh, I was hired by the Knicks, and it didn't take them long to find out my aptitude. They made me the statistician, and that was when. Wilt was looking over my shoulder when he found mm -hmm. out I was doing these ratings. <laughs> and his rating that year was just phenomenal. I mean, it was um, by any standards. Um, the, the Robertson and Chamberlain were two of the greats without a doubt. I mean, that I don't care when. And they were both great athletes. I, I think I, I talked about that quite a bit in the book. They weren't just basketball. They were great athletes. Wilt was a, was a world-class um, quarter miler. And once got so angry about his poor free throw shooting that he did a, a slam dunk from the free throw line. He backed up a few steps, ran, leaped, jammed the ball down before his seat hit the ground. Um, I think Jordan did that once in, in mm -hmm. show. But, well, I mean, he was seven feet tall. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but he had this incredible athleticism. And Robertson, I, 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 he just shocked even me the first time he picked up a baseball bat that I saw. The way he, he actually crushed the ball. I mean, he hit it as hard as, as Frank Robinson, maybe not as hard as Mickey Mantle, but he hit it as hard as the best. Some of, he just had power. They didn't call him a big over nothing. He was strong. He chokes up on the bat. <laughs> oh, I saw this in Cincinnati when I was covering the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, we, we were all smiling, thinking, well, what's going to happen? You know, Big O is going to take a swing. Yeah, ha ha. Well, ha ha. <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. He crushes the ball. Um, when you transition into um, from the seventies and into the eighties, I'm actually we have the three point line that comes into play at one point. It moves in and out and that kind of thing. What's the difference between let's say the eighties, nineties, and like the aughts? Uh, the difference between the eighties and the nineties and the what? The uh, the two thousands, the early two thousands, like the the type of things that influenced the game. Oh, oh and, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, they changed from the Red Auerbach theme of trying to hold Robinson and Chamberlain. He was always trying to get the referees to make calls against them because mm -hmm. the, the Celtics, they usually won, but they couldn't control Chamberlain or Robertson. So he was trying to find ways to connive around to get the officials to make calls against him. In the 80s, that all flip-flopped. The, um, the, the favoritism given to the Hotshot players was palpable. I mean, it didn't, you didn't have to be watching long to know that there were some favorites. And uh, Jordan was one, Magic was one. Uh, that was one of the big changes. And one of the reasons was that the league in the 80s was very athletic. Uh, and and the, the, it was flashy. It was, it was an exciting game. The 70s was kind of a transition. The league overall was probably as good as it was in the 80s. By the time the a the ABA uh, had, had had given up its players in the mid seventies, and the NBA, and then it kind of built through the eighties, mm -hmm. and then the, came the Jordan team in the nineties. But actually, the nineties slipped as far as the overall league was concerned. Not the Bulls, but the overall league really really fell, and it was obvious. It got so bad that in the two years that, that Jordan took off. The league just got so desperate that they shortened the three-point line because the games were, were like 91 to 90 instead of 112 to 110. And the fans were getting pretty bored, um, like I said, except for the, for the Bulls. They had Jordan, and he had been joined by Pippen and Rodman and Kukoc by the mid-90s. Um, but before Jordan came back to the team, they did this 
horrific thing about shortening the three-point line. It was in desperation because the, the league for those two years looked more like 1950 than it did 1985. Hmm. Um, uh, I would say that, well, it didn't take long to get over that uh, because by the time we got the 1996 draft kind of launched the league into the, into the 2000 decade, which was a good decade. And the 2010 decade was, was, I would say, almost as good as the 2000 decade. Uh, they were good decades. Um, but there was differences and it did fluctuate. Um, and one of the, one of the big things was the disaster of the, the shorting the three point line. Mm -hmm. What it did was it made the game even more boring because all the teams were just two to threes, two to three. I mean, but you didn't see any of the flash and dash slam dunks like you did in the 80s, uh, well, the 70s, or even the 60s. I mean, there, there was some great athletes in the 60s and 70s making slam dunks too. But the 80s was really the year of the flash and dash and the slam dunk. And the 90s, uh, there were some really good players. You know, Jordan, Shaq, uh, and, and there were others. Um, but the league overall quality was definitely weaker in the 90s. Um, and it did bounce back after that 1996 draft, in which, well, Kobe Bryant was drafted number 13. And, you know, well, mm -hmm. he was probably one of the 13 best in, in the history of the league, but he got drafted number 13 in 96. Right. And Alan Iverson, who was as far as I'm concerned, stiff, was number one. That, that was a catastrophic draft, but it produced a lot of great players who went on to have great careers. They just weren't drafted in the right place. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff, breaking it down with Dave. I tell you, I, I was like going through your book. I was kind of, obviously, I mentioned being a little bit of a nerd because I was uh, given a plethora of baseball cards, ba basketball cards. Baseball came later, but basketball cards uh, in that late 70s, early 80s. It was like my thing. I remember memorizing all the statistics on the back, and I knew all these different things, and uh, family members would be asking me different things that I would know as a child, and it was uh, – kind of made me connect to your book on a different level where I really, really enjoyed looking uh, through a different lens. And you, you had the, the great opportunity to be able to see a lot of these players in person. Probably, I don't know, is there anybody you didn't get to see? Like you just never got to see for some reason? I would say, yeah, in person there were. Uh, even even back in the 50s, uh, the tendency was to get me tickets to see the Knicks play the Syracuse Nationals or the Boston Celtics. I didn't, I didn't, I, I don't remember seeing George Mikey, mm. um, but I saw a lot of games back then. Um, I, let's see, who else did I not see in person? Um, off the top of my head, well, I didn't, I, I uh, Mikey was probably the best player I, I didn't, I never saw. Is there a, a performance that you were at live and you were just like, you just knew you were in the middle of something very, very special? Hmm. Yeah. You know, you see these last minute shots and you see these different things. I mean, I, I, obviously I was watching well, I, I most say, of these things on TV, but not in I'm person. Gonna, I'm going to cite TV yeah. because the, 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 <laughs> the greatest play I ever saw, uh, it, was, it was, they were televising the Olympic, Olympic Games. This was 92 that very famous team, very great team. Uh, they weren't amateurs anymore. The NCAA had screwed, screwed it up so badly that the NBA kind of took over the team. Right. And that was a great team. That great was team, a great yeah. team. So, so it was a 60 team with, with West and Robertson and, and got a lot of guys, Lucas. But 92, um, the backup point guard was John Stockton. Magic was the starter. But Stockton was, he, he was a both end guy back court. There was a problem with Magic trying to defend the point. But in this particular game, um, there was, a, was one play, the ball's going out of bounds, and Stockton is going after it. He's, 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 he's parallel to the floor, lunging like this with his right arm outstretched. Carmelo sees this. Of course, he's a he's teammate of Stockton, he's, he knows. He just, he just, he just knew Stockton was going to get that ball, and not only is he going to get it, but he's not going to just bat it back and bounce. 
he's going to somehow get his hand on it. So Carmelo is taken off, and he has a step or two on, on his defender. And Stockton, before he his body crashes into some steep seats, very painfully, I'm sure, gets his hand under the ball. And as he's going out, he gets it over. He gets that that is a sling it over his back, and it lands right in the hands of Carl Malone, 25 feet away. <laughs> it was the most unbelievable uh, play I ever saw in the NBA. Not just the assist; it was just an unbelievable play. And Malone had the mental capacity to say, "Hey, he's got a chance to do this." Yep. And so he took off and was there and stopped and did it. That was phenomenal. That was just phenomenal. Uh, obviously, different players have different reputations of doing different things. And one of my favorite was uh, obviously all the stories that are definitely shared a lot more now than they were back then, even though it was common back then. We know a lot more about now. Larry Bird being this legendary trash talker and those kinds of things, <laughs> you know, calling his shot on the floor, the famous one over Xavier McDaniel, right? Those kinds of things. Did you did you see um, like crazy trash talk slash the you know backing it up? Did you get the chance to see something like firsthand where you're like, oh my gosh? And then they 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 follow through like Jordan's notorious for this, right? I'm I'm coming for yeah, you. Jordan kind of was, was no saint. <laughs> yeah, he was notorious for this. Like I'm coming for you. Basically, was his message yeah. to a lot of these yeah, players. He would knock him down. <laughs> he didn't. He couldn't get around. Yeah. He would knock him down. <laughs> yeah. In fact. His most important basket was just like that because Utah had a chance to beat, had a good chance to beat uh, the Bulls in this one playoff series. Pippen was not 100%. And I, I think if they had won, if, they, if, the, if, the, if, the, if, if the, if the, if the, if Utah, I'm forgetting if Jazz, if the Jazz win this game, they're probably, I think, I, I think they put them up 3 2 and they would, would have gone on a one. Uh, and they had pretty much under control uh, until right at the end, the, the Bulls had a chance. They had they, they had a ball out of bounds, and they had a chance for, for one more shot. So what they did was uh, it was going to go to Jordan. Everybody knew it. Um, the Jazz had their best defender ready for Jordan. And Jordan, he just knocked the guy down. He just went like that, knocked him right that flat on the back, made the shot, won the game, no call. Yeah. And there was another one, Abdul Jabbar, against Detroit. Detroit is winning two by one point right at the end of the game. Abdul Jabbar gets the ball, he knocks, he he elbows. He didn't. He wasn't going to get the shot off. Lambert was right like this in his face, in order to, to get. Lambert out of there, after the bar, hits him with his elbow in the, in the head, and then takes the shot, misses the shot, but there's a whistle. You know, obviously it's an obvious foul against right. the bar. No, it's a foul against Lambert. Wow. <laughs> talk yeah. about person, talk about favoritism. That was about the worst favoritism I ever saw. Because Detroit, they were not a popular team. <laughs> and they, they had Rodman at that time, who was great, but not popular at all. They had Lambert, people hated him. Well. He never made a dirtier play than that. Well, hit the, hit the guy, the guy in the face with the elbow. Maybe you never did anything worse than that. But the call went against Lambert because Lambert was a bad guy. Yeah. Reputation, yeah. He yeah. played for Detroit. Detroit was a bad boy team. Um, the official officiating was by that time had gotten really bad. Uh, I can't remember it being that biased in the early days, but by the time the 80s came around, there were certain teams that were going to get the favorite calls, and certain players on those certain teams were really going to get the calls. Um, and that was, I, I think, perhaps the 80s were worse in that regard than any other decade, although it carried on. I mean, Shaq was, was allowed to just knock Muscle people all over the place and, mm -hmm. you know, go to the basket. Um, Certain players were just going to be allowed to do that, and I remember. I remember when Shaq, late in his career, when he joined the Miami Heat, uh, I was still in the Miami area and covering the sports in that area. And of course, I was into into pro basketball. And Ira Winderman, who was covering the team, they used to complain about uh, people fouling Shaq. Well, people didn't foul Shaq anything. 
like he fouled them. Yeah. <laughs> um, they would foul Shaq to, to make him go to the free throw line. Shaq would just, you know, knock people all over the place just for the sake of doing it uh, and, and get away with it. A lot, of, a lot of girls favoring Shaq, even even when he was an old an old guy. Um, it probably did help Miami win that one title, even though Wade just took control of the series. But they probably couldn't have won it without all the calls going for Shaq because Miami usually didn't get the calls like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things I like about the book is you, cause you, and you mentioned this earlier in our conversation, is you talk about like the per position breakdowns i think that was very very fascinating like obviously and i've heard you speak about you know the best shooters clearly steph curry and you see you know the best point guard you see some different um analysis and that kind of thing um when you put together those lists are there ever players that like this really surprise you like statistically like they're they're viewed as let's say a good player or a solid player but then when you start to break it in like for me at the bottom of your 75 list i see names like jeff hornacek and I'm like, well, Horncheck was always a good player and a solid player. But then when you start breaking down the efficiency, like you said, yeah, that is in your algorithm, great. very efficient. Yeah. yeah. Are there other are there other players that kind of surprise you like that where you put together your numbers and you're like, wow, that really kind of shocked me a little bit. That's even more than I would have ever expected. Well, I, I was surprised that Curry was so, you know, there, there have been a lot of great shooters in the NBA, but Curry is just – way ahead of the number two guy. I mean, the the average points per shot might be between 0.8, between, no, between, yeah, 0.8 points per shot and 0.9. Uh, and the really great shooters got to 1.0, got up, got over, got right up to one point per shot. Curry was over 1.1. I mean, he, he's, he's like 30%. The, the, the zone there between um, 800 and, and 1.0, which almost all of the other players fall into that zone, and he's 1.1. You know, you're talking about another 50% if you, if you, if you split that. Um, as far as that's concerned, that was the most – that and the fact that Dennis Rodman computed out as the greatest rebounder of all time – that one I just had to go over, over and over and over and over again. It always came out the same way he was, and and then you started to realize, well, um, the the league was different and Detroit was different. They played a slow down pace, so there weren't that many rebounds in a game, and he got the largest percentage of rebounds of any player during his minutes on the floor because. Detroit played this slow down, boring, you know, rough enough, rough stuff game. And other teams like the Lakers and the Celtics were running and gunning and putting up a lot of points. But Detroit didn't play that way. So Rodman leading the league, I think it was six times in rebound, was really exceptional because his team didn't play in games that had that many rebounds. <laughs> they just didn't available rebounds. Uh, that was a real surprise to me, um, probably more so even than Curry, because I, I knew Curry was a great shooter. I knew Rodman was a great rebounder, but his, his bulk numbers weren't even close to Chamberlain and Russell. But then when you started to get into all the intangibles, you, know, you realize that well, Chamberlain and Russell, their teams are scoring 115 or 120 points, and, and Detroit scoring 90, 95. Um, the, the game pace factor. The fact that, that Russell and Chamberlain were playing 45 minutes instead of 35 um, or 32 in, in, in Rodman's case, he usually did, didn't play more than about two thirds of the game. So he was actually the most efficient rebounder. And I had, I had <laughs> shaking my head. I didn't have anything against Rodman. Uh, I'm not, you know, like, um, I'm not like some people who just hated Rodman because, well, he had to show off. He, his game was not flash and dash, so he had the he had he had he had this uh, ex, extroverted personality. He wanted to be in the limelight, uh, but he didn't do limelight things. So he did kind of, yeah, um, what's the word I want? Unconventional <laughs> things to get attention. These outlandish off the court things. Yeah, yeah, but it wasn't because he was a bad guy. It was just you know he, he got a, he wanted some recognition and he really deserved it. When you run the numbers, 
Rodman, Rodman was a really great player, also a great defensive player. He deserved and, to be in the Hall of Fame. And I think people underestimate. I mean, he's only like six six. You know, he's in the he's on the floor with these players that are you know six ten to seven footers every single night, and he's pulling down double digit rebounds game after game after game. And even if it is uh, less opportunities, he just knew exactly where the ball was going to go. He knew how to get himself in position to get it. Like, it was really a key element to the Pistons' success, that's for sure. Yeah, they called him the worm. He would kind of yeah. worm his way in there. Yeah. Uh, and he had great hands. And he had a good leap, a good leap, but great timing. Uh, you didn't see the spectacular things like like Robertson and Jordan just off. You know, they could go up high enough to tim two basketballs, you know, one and then the other before they even came back down. Uh, Robin didn't do that, but he was a good leaper. Great timing, great hands. Uh, he just had an instinct for, for rebounding. He would he would just get the ball. He just couldn't know where it was going to go, and he would he would get it. Uh, it's hard to explain, but that's what he did because no, he would Chamberlain. He was five inches taller, weighed probably eighty more pounds, more muscular. Every and yet Rodman had a better. Not a better total rebounds, but a, a better percentage of the available rebounds. He was 23%, and the next two guys were 20%. That's wow. a big gap. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Uh, well, I know we'll, I, I'll make sure we get to the key. One of the key elements is on the cover, obviously. You know, the greatest player debate is uh, obviously uh, a large sort of like message in the in the book. And there they are. And you kind of alluded to it earlier when you talked about the analysis, the Tindex sort of identifying the uh, best player, the MVPs and Jordan's at eight. And it, it sort of like set these four players so significantly above everybody else. Yeah. Uh, speak to a little bit to that. And are you even a little bit surprised that they're in cat in a category sort of, and there's a big fall off between the four of them and everybody else. Yeah, I, I was until I started analyzing it and I realized that these four guys had it all. Mm. All four of them were tremendously strong. They called, they called Robertson the big O. They all were great athletes. They were all smart. They were all great clutch players. They they just did it all. And, and they all were very good defensive players, although Robertson was the best. Robertson would just shut people out. He was the best defensive player. Russell was the best. I do it this way. Russell was the best big play defender. He blocked a lot of shots. He would get the ball and throw it down, and they would go in for an easy layup. Or he would make these great steals. He would time himself just right to go around his guy he was defending. Just timed it so that he would get his hand on the ball and steal it. If he was off by that much, the guy was in for an easy layup. Mm. But Russell was phenomenal at timing that. Now, offensively, Russell was below average. If, if, if his whole team had been like Russell, they would have averaged about 85 points a game. He was not a good offensive player. And, and this, it's in spite of the fact that he had the same advantage as the other centers did, playing close to the basket, but he had a poor field goal percentage. Hmm. He had a, he had a, he had a bad free throw percentage too, and he didn't have Chamberlain's excuse. Chamberlain and Shaq had a reason. They were so strong that they had very little touch. Now Chamberlain did have a touch for his, you know, finger roll, but from the line, it was all, boom, you know, bam. Um, but Russell didn't have that excuse. He wasn't. He, he was. He was two two twenty. Chamberlain was three hundred pounds. Um, so. Really, it was these four guys. They really were, and and it's a wide margin down to number five. Now, you know, different people were were rate them different ways. I think because of the intangibles, taking away all those assists from Robertson, and um, and there were other intangibles that favored Robertson's rating going higher. The others were kind of where they were. And you could just say, well, I, I think Jordan was better than James, so I, you know, okay. Yeah. And you could even say, well, I think Jordan was better than Robertson, but it's harder 
to, to do that because it's kind of like Rodman three bats. There's a big gap between Robertson and the others when you get uh, the assists in, in, in there uh, and the fact that Robertson's prime decade, and that's what you go by because athletes have a prime decade and usually it's about 18 to 28. But Robertson was one of the few athletes who actually had acquired the game skills to be one of the best in the world, if not the best, while he was still in high school. Um, he was 18 years old. He was phenomenally strong and fast in every way. But he also had developed these skills. And usually, well, in Jordan's case, he really didn't max out his skills until about his third or fourth year in the NBA. Right. Uh, I'd say his third. Uh, but Robertson, Robertson was probably at, at or near his peak when he was a senior in, in high school. The three greatest college seasons, and these were not close, were all Robertson. One, two, three, sophomore, junior, senior. Robertson was just that much above everybody else. Um, and it was a wide margin. These were, they didn't count, like with Tendex. <laughs> I mean, uh, Tendex only rated for, for this for this book the the professional uh, right uh, seasons, and by the time Robertson was in his seventh NBA season, he was already slipping. Well, his prime decade had been three more years college and first six NBA. Uh, most players don't are not that fast to develop, and they and they're not worn out. He was kind of worn out by that time mm. because of all the minutes he played. Um, most guys are not worn out when they're in, in mid-career in the NBA. Uh, but even a worn out, Robertson was great in, in his one chance in the playoffs. He just he just was fantastic, shutting out, shutting down Earl of Portland. Earl scored points, but he shot very bad against Robertson. And then Abdul Jabbar nominated the post, and, and Robertson scoring and getting the ball at, at the right place for Abdul Jabbar. That was the greatest team. It really was. You just, they had clinched the number one seed more than a month before the season ended. Wow. And they, and they won four straight against, um, uh, I think it was Baltimore. The, it was the Bullets. I think it was Baltimore at that time. And they, and they were all double figure margins. I think there was a 119 point victory on the road or something. I mean, they just, uh, they, they just, could have won all four games by, by about 20 points. They were just so much better. And this was not a bad team. This was a great decade in the NBA. There were eight different teams won titles in that decade. Right. The Knicks won two of them. The Lakers won two. Then there were six other teams won one, one each. So this was not a bad decade. Uh, it was a transitional one because some players were coming out of the ABA. It probably wasn't as good as the 80s. But it was a it was it was a good decade. It was not a bad one. Um, but some, but that t that team that Milwaukee team, um, and Robertson even set himself up for it because he was the negotiator for the players' union, uh, who just turned the league upside down. Um, in one in one day, it went from a league of paupers to a league a league of very very wealthy men. Awesome. Uh, and that was Robertson again. He had also incredible leadership talent. And the other guys did too. Um, LeBron, great leadership. Uh, Jordan, great leadership. Chamberlain, great leadership. These four guys just did not have any flaws, except for the fact that Wilt was so strong. And that wasn't really a flaw because <laughs> it was an advantage. But in the free throw line, it was a flaw. Mm. Let me uh, let me close with kind of a different, like a nuanced question here. Are there players, because I thought of two, who because of injuries just couldn't mount the career, but they had seasons that were phenomenal. I thought about Grant Hill and like Penny Hardaway. It's like when they first started, they were just so phenomenal and they were so uh, apt at different uh, elements, you know, yet their injuries couldn't. They, they couldn't really have a career that was worth, I'm going to say worth no, because Grant Hill had a good career, but not like what they could have if the injuries hadn't gotten in the way. Yeah, in fact, the guy you mentioned would be the first one I would think of. Grant Hill had some 
great years in the NBA, but he showed the ability to have done much, much more. I think he would have been a better player than Larry Bird mm. uh, if he had, if he kept himself healthy. He was a little bit more athletic than Bird, and he could all, do all the other things Bird could do. He would have been probably number five on that list. Grant wow. Hill just was phenomenal, phenomenal player. Maybe not as good as the top four, but probably better than guys like Harden and Durant, who, who, who were five and six. Um, yeah, Grant Hill. And um, I'm trying to think. There were some other guys, too. Uh, injuries. Uh, it's not in the book, but it's an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, absolutely right. Injuries are a big factor. Um, and, and guys like, well, Jordan retired for two years. I think it was just to get his legs back. Mm. He was worn out through three these hard seasons with something like 3,200 minutes. And he was past the age of, he was right at the age of 30 when he was doing this on uh, the first three, the last three where he was well up in the thirties. Um, so he, he, he didn't just retire. He just took two years off to get his legs back. Right. And when he came back in, in 96, he was just about where he had been the first year of the, of, the, of the three before that because he was completely refreshed. But most guys either couldn't or wouldn't or wouldn't even think of it. But Jordan was prominent enough that he could do just about anything he wanted. Uh, Robertson should have taken off. He, had, he, he, took more, he played more minutes than Jordan. Um, and he was playing just as tough a position, maybe more, more of a tough position. A point guard is, you know, you, you have the really tough guy to defend, quick guy usually, and then you have to have the ball. You have, the offense is on your back. Uh, yeah, if there was one problem that those four guys had, it was too many minutes. Mm, right, yeah. Well, Dave, it's been great chatting with you. It's a book I want to recommend. It's called 75, and we'll put links there for you folks. You can get your copy. And uh, I'd love to chat with Dave again, man. We could just keep going down different categories and eras because it's just it's such a uh, – you're such a mountain of information and experience. I, I just really enjoyed it. I really do. Because, I mean, I didn't even really get to, like, underrated players and all that because there's, there's so much in the book, and you're going to find something that you can reminisce about, folks, if you're a big fan like I was. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember him. I remember him. So – it's great. So, Dave, thanks again for your time. I appreciate it so much. Well, thanks for having me, Brandon. I appreciate it. All right, my friend. We'll cut right there. Uh, that's awesome, man. This is really cool. I really, really enjoyed that's this. Fun. It's just fun, really. Is My whole life has been a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> been in the right place at the right time. Did you do stats like this for uh, NFL at all or baseball? I know Bill James yeah, is doing I did. the baseball I, I thing. Did the same. There are logical stats. Um, and even before this, this 43 year old Super Bowl, uh, Tom Brady was among the top three now for sure. Uh, and that's the very sophisticated Brady. And that's better than the, than the NFL's rating system. Brady was in the top three. The other two were, uh, Steve Young and Otto Graham. Oh, wow. I know those, those are two surprises. Uh, but when you run the numbers <laughs> and Graham, of course, he, he went back to just just after the war, just when the NBA was just starting out. But man, he had the he was far and away the um, highest rating of, of yards per pass of any quarterback. Hmm. It was way above the number two guy. Uh, he he had one negative thing that probably kept him from being at, at Brady's level, and that was a lot of interceptions. But in the time when he played. Um, there were more interceptions and more touch, touchdown passes per pass than, than later on. It, because at that time, they, when you threw the ball, you were looking for the end zone, not just throwing little things right. here and there. Uh, but, yeah, that was that was one. And um, You know, the thing about Brady, you, you brought that up. This won't be in our – I don't yeah. think I'll publish this. I didn't realize it, and I hear these things. Every time I look at his stats, I always find something new. He never had a losing record playing. Like there were seasons where he got hurt and, you know, the Patriots didn't do well that year or whatever, but his winning record is every single year. It was fascinating looking at some of the, and again, he's 44 years old, led the league in passing and touchdowns. And <laughs> he did his job to get my bucks there. And then their defense just yeah, they kinda, threw it they, away, man. I couldn't believe it. It was devastating. Well, 
Brady, well, like I said, it was there was three of them, but yeah. really in the end it was Brady. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean you run run the numbers. Uh when you ran the numbers back when I did. I didn't I haven't run them lately, but when I was running them up until a few years ago. Uh, even then Brady was was right up there with the top, the other two guys. Yeah. Steve Young was very much underrated. He 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 could throw it, he could run it, he could he could do it. Um yeah, his name's surprising when you brought that one into the equation. Honor Graham, I know than, enough about, but I he was I, better I than Montana respect. when you run the numbers. The uh, 49ers with Young were a little bit older and not quite as good depth as as when Montana was playing. But but Young's numbers were better than Montana's. And yeah, there was a lot of lot of lot of things. You, you could do logical statistics in all of the team sports. Mm. And that's, that was what I, I guess the Lord blessed me with the ability to do that. Logical, not, not just the numbers, you know, anybody can add, subtract, multiply and divide, but doing, doing these things and then thinking of these other things, for instance, the Robertson thing about, um, nobody else was thinking about that, but I, I didn't feel right about, uh, um, <laughs> well, not just Robertson, Jordan. Jordan be a good example. Um, everybody said, well, he was the greatest because he had all those Super Bowls, but his best years were before 1990. Mm -hmm. But he had the teammates, and that was the thing that, that made it for him. And the same with Bill Russell. You know, I said, well, he had the most titles. Well, the number two guy was his teammate, Sam Jones. Uh, were they the two greatest of all time? No. And then, and then number three and four were his teammates, John Havlicek and I think it was Casey Jones, who was a below average player. But the, the, were they the four greatest of all time? No, they just had this great team and a great coach. Yeah. That was yeah. it. It's and the same with Jordan. Though. Jordan was not winning until he got great teammates. Yeah, it, it wasn't until we had Oakley and Grant and Pippen came on the scene and things like that about. I remember living through that too. Like, you know, we, Rod, we were. Rodman was very important. Oh, Coming, right. After Grant had retired, Robin was huge. Yeah, when I remember checking stats like that, and it was always about how Jordan did, but you know, he only won like you know a little over half the games. And then, of course, in hockey, it was like Gretzky. It was the same kind of thing. It's like a different yeah. caliber of player, and yeah, it's great. I, I did a I did a, some hockey stats too. That's awesome. And yeah, uh, Gretzky was he was definitely right up there. The, the Boston Bruins defender, who, who could have been a, an All Star forward. I mean, his name is eluding me, but his he just his numbers just jumped out because he was a great defender and he was one of the league's leading scorers. Wow! He, I'm, I can't remember his name. Is that Ray Bork? No, it was it went back pretty far. Oh, okay. I'm not familiar with that old hockey. Bobby Orr, of course, but yeah. Not gonna... Well, Bobby. Bobby Orr. Yeah, it was a defender. I think. I think it was. I think it was. Yeah. Well, Dave, thanks again for your time. I appreciate our conversation. It was awesome. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks, Dave.